Good evening, friends. My name is Alicia McBride, and I serve friends as FCNL's Director of Quaker Leadership. And welcome to our February Quaker Changemaker event, The Journey for Just Migration Policy. Before we get started, I want to turn things over to my colleague, Emma Holbert, to share a little bit about how we're going to gather this evening. Thanks, Alicia. Hi, friends. Uh, my name is Emma Holbert, and I'm the Program Assistant for Quaker Outreach at FCNL. Uh, and I will be running technology for this event this evening. Uh, so I just wanna go over a few tech considerations before we get started. Uh, first, please, I'd invite you to say hello in the chat. Uh, this is a great way to build community virtually and it's really fun to see who is here. So if you wanna share your name, uh, your location and meeting our church, if you have one, uh, we're so glad that you all could make it. Uh, as you can see, we are recording this evening's speaker portions, uh, but the audience will not be included in this recording for, uh, for privacy reasons. Uh, that being said, feel free to turn off your video uh, if you are at all uncomfortable with keeping it on. Uh, in addition, captioning is available automatically. Uh, if you don't want to see the captions, you can click on the live transcript option on your Zoom toolbar and click hide subtitles. Uh, we will have some time for you to ask some questions towards the end of the event this evening, and we'll do our best to address as many questions as we have time for, uh, but we likely will not get to all of them. Uh, so I just suggest submitting your questions as they come to you throughout this event in the chat, uh, and I will direct them to the panelists and make sure they get there. Uh, if you're calling in on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand if you have a question you would like to ask during our Q&A portion. Uh, we will unmute you and invite you to ask your question via the phone. And finally, just feel free to contact me if you are in need of any sort of Zoom tech support throughout our time together this evening. Uh, you can private chat me from Zoom's chat bar or email me at eholbert at fcnl.org. Back to you, Alicia. Thank you, Emma. It's great to see so many friends here and friends big and small f. Um, as we gather tonight to talk about migration, I do want to recognize that escalating hostilities by Russia towards Ukraine, which in addition to bringing suffering and violence, could also lead to a crisis of migration. Uh, I saw one report this afternoon that the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. estimates that a Russian invasion could displace up to 5 million Ukrainians. So as we settle into some grounding worship to hold those affected by this conflict in the light, I invite you to join me for a few moments. Thank you, friends. So I want to start uh, this conversation reading an excerpt from a Quaker statement on migration, which FCNL joined in on with several other Quaker groups last year or the year before last. Um, and it's a reminder of what this work for just migration policy is about. The statement says, we are heartbroken by migration policy that dehumanizes some members of our human family on the basis of where they come from. We reject the notion that security for some can be achieved through means that use or result in violence and insecurity for others. We abhor the many forms of violence used in the management of migration and the effect current migration systems have in dividing our human family. We are committed to working for a world where dignity and rights are upheld regardless of migration status and not on the basis of citizenship or perceived deservedness. Our faith calls us to work alone and with others for migration justice. This work is ongoing and as you know, I referenced before, critical. Many of you have been part of advocating on these issues for decades and the need continues to push this forward in Congress to pass a pathway to citizenship, reform a system that assaults black and brown communities and affirms the right of asylum seekers and refugees. 
So I'm really pleased to have joining me for this discussion tonight, um, Anika Forrest and Patrick Kelly, who both bring their perspectives on lobbying, uh, on migration policy and organizing for immigration justice. So first, Anika Forrest leads FCNL's migration policy program by integrating her knowledge of the legislative process, political advocacy and public policy reform. She is working to protect the rights of all immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers and migrants. Anika is an adjunct professor of law at Temple University Beasley School of Law. As a first generation American, Anika is unapologetically committed to advancing community engaged movements that will cultivate equitable, humane and inclusive systems. And we're also joined tonight by Patrick Kelly, who is a former advocacy core organizer with FCNL and a senior at the University of Notre Dame. He majors in political science and Latino studies and has experienced interning in the House Democratic Cloakroom for the office of Speaker Nancy Pelosi. He serves as the political director for the College Democrats of Notre Dame, the outreach coordinator for the Student Coalition for Immigration Advocacy, and is passionate about creating a more just immigration system in the United States. So to get things started, I wanna start off um, talking about the words we use to discuss these issues. I'm a strong believer in the power of language to shape how we think about something. And I've noticed the language around these issues has been changing, uh, both in terms of the conversation um, and also in terms of, of the way that FCNL is calling, you know, we used to call this immigration position uh, program, and now, now we've changed it to migration policy. Um, so starting with you, Anika, you know, we, we renamed this program from to migration policy. Can you talk about what's behind that name change and why the words we use to describe this work matter? Sure, absolutely. Um, you're right, there's often sort of this interchangeable language that we see, um, particularly in the world of migration. It might be migration justice, it might be fair immigration reform, could be immigration rights. And when thinking about um, the policy work and the advocacy work we do at FCNL, I found that it really is based more in um, the personal experience and the personal stories and human-centered advocacy, um, more so than the structures and institutions in which we're trying to reform. We can't get away from that. We are, we are dealing with laws and policy, so there is that sort of infrastructural component, um, but it really is about how do we focus on the people who are impacted. And so I wanted to be able to convey that in the way that we talk about our work in the process that communities are going through from the precursors that lead to migration, um, often forced migration to the experiences um, and conditions when experienced when in that journey. Um, and then what happens in terms of your reception and arrival and then ultimately, hopefully, your integration um, into the US and what would be um, your new home. And I think the other piece was always also thinking about how we synthesize work that really is um, domestic and foreign policy, some people will call it formistic, so to speak, and how we how we have that synthesis and how we allow that globalist approach to translate in the work that we do and to ensure that our messaging is authentic to the faith grounding and moral grounding that we have um, and to the, um, the humanity of the work. Yeah, that's something I really like about um, FCNL's approaches in general is that even though Congress can get very narrow on, you know, one issue and one LA working on that issue that, that we really do try to, to make those connections. Um, so Patrick, I was wondering when you are talking with students in South Bend, Indiana, how do you talk about these issues and, and what have you found that connect with people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my approach is pretty similar. I think stressing the human aspect is really important. Um, at least in my Latino studies classes that I've taken while I'm here uh, at Notre Dame, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, the root causes of migration and, and the reasons that people do make the choice or are forced to come to the United States um, and the role that the United States government has played uh, in those situations. Um, and I found that the most important thing that connects people, at least at the University of Notre Dame, is, is making sure that they understand the situation at hand before anything else. Um, it's pretty difficult for somebody to get that background knowledge um, and learn about uh, the wars and poverty and, and crises that may cause people to flee their home countries and still feel apathetic uh, towards the issue. Um, and then additionally, like 
really connecting through empathy and trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the people that are fleeing their home countries um, seems to help a lot as well. Um, and just trying to understand that a lot of the people that are migrating to the United States aren't doing so just because you know they want like a change of scenery or, or want to move. Um, rather, it's a lot of times a life or death situation. Um, and that really seems to get the message across that this is something that we really should work on changing as young adults. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting you both talk about the importance of focusing on the people involved and not, you know, I, I think it can be easy to start talking about big numbers or obscure laws. Uh, and I think it sounds like you're both saying like coming back to the, the individuals and the people and the stories is, is what's important. Um, I know you've both spent quite a bit of time with these issues and thinking about how to organize people and move policy, but I want to go back and ask, how did you first get involved with this work, and what are the experiences that steered you towards working in this area of migration policy and how that shaped what you're doing now? Patrick, why don't you start this time? For sure. So I've been taking uh, Spanish classes ever since the fourth grade. Um, just because it was required in grade school. And then I continued on because it was something that I was kind of good at. Um, and then in high school, I took a service trip to Chicago. I'm originally from Philadelphia. Um, and while we were there, we visited a nonprofit organization called Taller de Jose, which uh, was essentially their job was to accompany Spanish speaking immigrants in the area to legal proceedings to make sure that they weren't being take advantage, taken advantage of. Um, and I found that work to be admirable and it made me consider um, immigration law as a career. Um, and so with that, uh, when I came to college, I declared political science and Spanish actually as my two majors um, because I thought that would be uh, the most logical way to end up as an immigration lawyer. Um, but then as I kind of progressed through the Spanish major, I realized that at least at Notre Dame, um, all of the Spanish major requirements are mainly focused on like literature from Spain. And I was more interested in the immigration work. So I was like, what do I do here? Um, and then I found the Latino studies uh, major, switched from Spanish to Latino studies. And luckily all my classes transferred over. Um, and then I started you know, taking classes that were more focused on the stuff that I was actually interested in. Um, and the Latino studies major is really interesting. We There's a lot of community-based learning classes. Um, and so in my time here, I've, I've done things like worked uh, at a community center in South Bend to teach English as a new language to Spanish speaking adults. Um, one of the classes I took was a community based class where we uh, once a week met with local uh, immigrant families uh, and spoke with them in Spanish to get their family history. And the final project for that class was a, a physical scrapbook that we presented to them uh, that detailed their family history that they could pass on from generation to generation to make sure that it wasn't being lost. Um, and then I did some research with the Prevention Through Deterrence Campaign and Migrant Farms in Indiana. Um, and then the political science department sent out an email my junior year about the Advocacy Corps program. And that year uh, we were focusing on uh, the Dream and Promise Act, which provided a pathway to citizenship for DACA recipients in the United States. I applied for that, ended up getting it, and then spent the entirety of my junior year uh, lobbying both Indiana senators and South Bend's representative on the Dream and Promise Act. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is, it is interesting uh, how you can find the thread of something that you encountered, you know, as a, as a pretty young kid and sort of how that, that, uh, that pulls through the story. Anika, uh, what about you? I would say though the circumstances are different um, also sort of resonate with the idea of migration meaning something from um, a very early age. For me, it's virtually all I've ever known um, as a first generation American and as a Caribbean um, American woman. So um, what I heard at the kitchen table or on Sunday afternoons re revolved around the ideas of um, immigrating to the U.S. and sort of how you synthesize cultures and um, the social, political, and economic policies in the U.S. that made things challenging for, um, if not my immediate family, my community members. And so I found myself um, at a pretty early age wrestling um, with how we create change and allow for equitable um, sort of 
policies and procedures in our country. And then I would say high school is probably the first time where um, sort of personal convictions um, were able to resonate more in terms of how do you actually get involved in work or make action. I um, attended West Ham School, a Quaker boarding school, and I can recall that my first sort of um, protest was actually when we did a, a trip to Philadelphia for immigration rights. Um, and then also my senior year for a senior project, we went to Guatemala focusing on the civil war that had happened there, which um, resulted in um, genocide, but also much migration and sort of how the, the sort of legacy of those harms have impacted the country still to today. And so um, I found myself um, very appreciative that I, I began to see like how faith in action can actually work. And it sort of strengthened my resolve and understanding that I, I can take my personal stories and my personal experiences um, and sort of leverage them and maximize them in a larger setting and in a larger way. So um, it seems very fitting that I am now at a Quaker-based institution doing migration work because it, um, it really is a continuum of um, what my life story has been thus far. Yeah. Well, thank you both for, for sharing that. And yes, Emma has uh, read my mind and just put in an uh, invitation. If you have questions that you'd like us to get to um, in a little bit, please uh, feel free to share those in the chat. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, but now I wanna turn to thinking about uh, sort of what's going on now. Um, Congress has been batting around legislation on migration justice for a long time. Uh, I know, We've had many FCNL lobby days and uh, different things focused on these issues, um, but also that there's a real chance right now to move something forward. And you know, I, I saw Michael Snar and his students uh, are are joining us. They're some of the people who are going to be coming to DC in just a few weeks to our spring lobby weekend, where we're advocating for Congress to protect the dignity of undocumented immigrants and establish a pathway to citizenship. So um, Anika, what are some of the opportunities coming up in Congress for proposals around this issue that could move forward? And what, if, if someone on this call is really interested in following or, or advocating um, with Congress on this, you know, what, what should they be watching for? Yeah, um, Alicia, you bring a good point. Sort of, we, we've been on the journey for our pathway to citizenship for what seems like eons. Um, the last time we had major legislation move on this, um, giving myself away. I wasn't even born yet. Um, so we, we have a lot of work that has to be done to think about our communities who have been left vulnerable for decades upon decades. Um, and so we find ourselves right now where um, this session of Congress is, is probably the most promising um, sort of legislative community that we've seen in a very long time because the majority of Congress across both chambers um, do support a pathway to citizenship. The particulars of how they support it may vary a little bit, but we have most folks who are willing to engage in this conversation. Um, and likewise, our White House um, very adamantly believes in a pathway to citizenship for our undocumented community members. So FCNL, um, while Pathways to Citizenship has always been one of our primary um, legislative priorities, you see that really ramping up um, right now, which is part of the reason why we have Spring Lobby Weekend. Congress has passed a few um, different pieces of legislation, particularly the House has related um, to undocumented immigrants. And just last summer, we saw both chambers agreed to create a framework for a pathway to citizenship. And that has received some legislative delays and sort of procedural hurdles as we often see. Um, but I'm often heartened that we see our, our leaders and congressional leaders still saying, this is not over. We are gonna find a way to deliver for community members. And so FCNL is also very much um, continuing in that, in that charge. And um, we have a special place in this conversation as a faith group, as a nonpartisan group, um, and being able to sort of bridge some of the gaps that we often see when talking about pathways to citizenship to ensure that communities aren't harmed in the process and that there aren't um, inequitable trade-offs. So often we hear things about the border or we hear about well, we're not going to talk about pathways unless we change our asylum laws and seek asylum seeking processes, or um, we have to have penalties and for uh, undocumented community members. And I think FCNL is very well um, sort of in 
sort of driven and motivated to find a way to say, well, how do we parcel out these conversations within Congress um, and have true reform that isn't harmful to folks, that doesn't um, disproportionately impact our people of color and immigrant communities who are often very disadvantaged by the immigration system because of the same systemic racism issues that we see in other structures um, bleed over into our immigration system as well. So I'm very much eager and looking forward to Spring Lobby Weekend and the purpose behind it. I think for those um, who have folks who are in their communities who are within that young adult sphere, um, we are still taking registrants um, for virtual participation. So we very much encourage you to encourage them to join us and calling on their members of Congress to support a pathway to citizenship. Um, and then for all of us, we can partake in our um, action letters and other efforts letting your members of Congress know that you feel that we have a moral calling to uphold um, the dignity of all of our immigrants and to create them opportunities to have full inclusion in the US, um, somewhere that they contribute to greatly already. Great, yeah. I'm looking forward to Spring Lobby Weekend too. It's gonna to be our first uh, real hybrid event with people back in person, so it's very exciting. Um, Patrick, you were talking about how you got started organizing, you know, locally around immigration. So if someone uh, joining us is wondering how to get started sort of building this movement in their community, what, what would be the advice you'd have for them? Yeah, for sure. Well, not to beat a dead horse, but I would also recommend if you're a young adult to come to Spring Lobby Weekend. I will be there in person leading a delegation from Notre Dame and would love to see um, some familiar faces. But I think... Um, especially from my experience, really reaching out to your own community um, and seeing if there are those organizations that exist, which I'm sure there are that are advocating for uh, immigration, uh, just immigration policy, or just focused on helping immigrants in the community. L like I said before, I uh, freshman year would travel weekly to uh, an organization here in South Bend to teach English as a new language classes to Spanish speaking immigrants in the community. Um, and I think one way, at least in my experience, to find those organizations is really just as simple as searching for like immigration organization, nonprofit, insert wherever you're from, like whatever city into Google and things will come up on Google and um, hopefully you can find somewhere to get involved. There's plenty of um, community centers and, and organizations to get involved with. And I think another way that you could probably get involved is reaching out to your faith community. Um, as Aniki kind of touched on, like the intersection between faith and just migration policy, uh, there's a large intersection of it. And I think that that is a really easy way to get involved. Um, and I think if it's something that you're passionate about um, you're and you start to get involved, you're gonna meet people that are also passionate about it and then they're gonna expand your horizons and also have opportunities for you to get involved with. And then it just is kind of like a snowball. Yeah, um, I, I think sort of what Patrick mentioned sort of reiterates the sort of the power in the work that we do. I think so often the local seems siloed and removed from the DC, like Beltway, Capitol Hill um, advocacy and work. Um, and it's a misnomer. Our local communities are integral parts of how we are able to um, persuade legislators to pursue just migration. Because um, at the end of the day, they want to know and they want to hear what their constituents care about and what their constituents um, feel needs to happen um, on a national scale. And so we almost find the same way people locally sort of build themselves in the world of advocacy from getting more informed, getting more aware to, to becoming advocates in their own right. Um, we see that happen with our legislators as well, where um, the more they have interactions with folks like FCNL and their constituents, um, they become more aware and we see ideological shifts and their perception changes to the point that they um, aren't even just content with like, okay, I understand this issue, but they move to the realm of how do I act on this issue? How can I become an ally in this work? Um, so we often want to think that um, the local person in South Bend, so to speak, um, has the same trajectory as a member of Congress, but you do see a lot of parallel in that. Yeah, there's definitely a theme going on with the, the personal experience in this in this conversation. I see people are starting to put some questions in the chat, so keep, keep those coming. We'll get to those uh, pretty soon. But I, I wanted to come back to, you know, I think something that's come up a little bit throughout our conversation um, is the, the connections between racism and racial violence and how that's really baked into our immigration system. 
And Anika, I've heard you talk about how the system isn't broken. It's working exactly as it's intended. And Patrick, you mentioned your thesis, um, you know, thinking about anti-immigration sentiment. Um, so can you say a little bit more about this historic foundation of systemic racism in the immigration system and how does that history, why is that history important for the, the advocacy we're doing today? Yeah. Maybe Anika, you can start, yeah. Sure, um, it's crucial when doing migration justice work to be able to identify the harms and where they originated because then you understand the ideologies that you're um, dealing with today, be they intentional or unintentional, they're sort of very much seeped within um, the culture of the way our immigration system works. And when we think about, for example, citizenship, um, that was something that was originally rooted in whiteness. If we think about the Dred Scott um, decision back in the 1800s, where we were told that Blacks were not citizens, that didn't happen until the 14th Amendment. And there are so many iterations of that all throughout history. We had the Chinese Exclusion Act. We had um, wetback laws, particularly that impacted um, Latinos in the agricultural um, sector um, in, the ninth, in the 20th century. And then we still see this happening today, um, but reiterated in other ways. Maybe it's our laws dealing with re-entry for those who were previously deported and who are now coming back to the US. Um, just last year, a judge ruled that those laws are actually very much um, coached within racism and they're known to be racially biased and yet we haven't done anything about that. We see that within the criminal bars that are used within our citizenship process where um, the same communities that are impacted by a unjust criminal legal system um, aren't just citizens, they apply to non-citizens as well. And so that spills over when we think about our black indigenous communities and our people of color. Um, and so when we're talking about immigration, we have to look at this broad spectrum of the racial history and how we address it and how we undo it. Um, I think that's why you've seen a lot of work um, happening recently about black migrants and how do we create a more equitable um, sphere. And groups like FC now have been following the lead of prominent groups like Undocu Black um, and the Black Alliance for Just Mike Immigration because they work with communities and we find that it's important for us to be allies and to know when it's our time to lead and when it's our time to be intentional partners. Um, when we look at Haitian migrants, um, it's been a very sobering and disheartening experience. I think we all um, will vividly remember the occurrences last September, particularly the images that invoked very strong feelings about the most harmful um, and oppressive times in US history against black um, communities and against black people. And so um, we have to be able to speak to that and we have to be able to, to undo those, those those very perpetual um, grievances. And it starts with being able for folks to understand the, those historical elements and saying, okay, we identify it now, how can we actually reform it? And it's, um, it's a long process, but um, I think I become more encouraged to see the more that we do. Just recently, we had um, over a hundred members of Congress calling out um, some of the border practices that we have. I saw someone ask about um, the migrant protection protocols in Title 42, which we can definitely talk about more, but those, ha those have impacted our black immigrants a lot. And you have members of Congress who are actually stepping up more now and saying that this is unacceptable and we have to do something about it. Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, my understanding is sometimes that even the, the education that we can do with members of Congress and their staff about the, the sort of racial um, background of some of these laws can be important. Patrick, how do you want to respond to this? Yeah, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, my senior thesis, um, just a little bit more background. Um, so I'm writing a thesis uh, in political science that's focused on anti-immigrant sentiment throughout US history um, by analyzing congressional speeches that were surrounding major immigration bills. Um, and interestingly enough, my advisor and I thought that we're essentially looking for uh, similarities across time to try and figure out why this has been so consistent throughout American history. Um, and we thought that it was going to be mainly focused on economics or the perception of threat. Um, but what I actually found as I started uh, doing my research, and by no means am I an expert, this thesis is very much still in the works, but a lot of uh, the language that has been used throughout U.S. history uh, is very blunt um, and talks 
about uh, the racial composition of the United States. Um, and I have a quote, uh, particularly speaking about the Immigration Act of 1924, which established uh, national quotas uh, for immigrants entering the United States, um, which isn't the current system anymore. But uh, back when they were discussing this bill, uh, when it was on the floor, one, one politician was quoted saying uh, in his subcommittee debating the bill that the subcommittee believes that the adoption of the national origins formula was a rational and logical method of numerically restricting immigration in such a manner as to best pre preserve the sociological and cultural balance in the population of the United States, which an, es an expert later noted that the will of Congress was to preserve the racial composition of the US through the selection of immigrants through those countries whose traditions, languages, and political systems were akin to those of this country. Um, so in uh, other words, this bill was essentially created to keep America white. Um, and it's just been very interesting to learn and research um, how these bills were created in a way that was, I mean, to be blunt, racist. Um, and I think it's important to understand that the foundation of our immigration system is racist and that should be informing how we're dealing with it today and and the steps that we're taking to advocate for changes um and i think on that note it's it's important also to realize that this is an ongoing process and there's always going to be work that's going to be done because the roots of this issue go way back yeah, so patrick sort of makes me think as well um so often when we're thinking about immigration citizenship um there's this cultural narrative of, um, well, folks should come the right way, right, or my ancestors came the right way. And so often that's divorced from or decoupled from who were those folks that were able to come. Um, it wasn't always um, our communities of color. And so when we're thinking about that um, now, it's, it's, it's important to be honest about who we were admitting and who we still continue to have preference in terms of who we admit. Well, thank you both for raising so many issues. I'm sure that um, people have a lot to think about. I want to turn now to some questions from the audience. I, um, so please, uh, if you have questions or topics you want to dig into a little bit more, uh, feel free to put those in the chat. But um, Anika, you mentioned the question that came in. Can you talk about, uh, first of all, maybe define what MPP and Title 42 are, and then uh, talk about what's going on with that? Yeah, so um, MPP stands for the Migrant um, Protection Protocols, which is often referred to as the Remain in Mexico program. Um, and that was created during the Trump administration. And it required people who were coming to the US um, to seek asylum and so forth to actually remain in Mexico until they had a court proceeding in the US. And so um, it has been a humanitarian nightmare and disaster. There have been many who have been victim to um, threats, sexual assault, death, the list goes on. Um, and the Biden administration has tried to terminate this program, but has experienced a lot of resistance in the courts. Um, it's currently now before the Supreme Court with some briefings um, to take place um, very soon. And um, we find also that coupled with that is the public health quote unquote measure title 42 which was also created by the trump administration that was at um, the onset of the pandemic saying that for um, during a time of pandemic and when those um, who um, were faring a disease and a virus and so forth um, we are going to limit our admissions at the borders and so folks are automatically expelled um, without having the traditional processes that would be allotted to them at our borders. And we have found that this has impacted a lot of asylum seekers, which is a, a legal right to come and assert your right to asylum. And our laws require people to do that by coming to our borders and coming to our port of entry. And yet that is not being honored. And you have found um, that the Biden administration has been very resistant to lift this measure, this public health policy, um, and has actually enforced it more um, than we saw in the previous administration. And so constantly um, and continuously immigration advocates and members of Congress are pointing out um, not only the human rights violations, um, not only the fact that there are public health arguments that this is illogical and ineffective, but it also creates 
um, this bloating, so to speak, at our borders where there is inefficiency and we're not having a streamlined process. And so what last year we saw a lot about very high numbers at our borders. And I think that alarmed a lot of people when the truth is between Remain in Mexico, between Title 42, we almost have um, a recycling, so to speak, of people who are trying to find a way to get into the U.S. and find a refuge, and um, they're not having the, the options to do that. So this administration may not have a wall, so to speak, but our policies are creating this sort of invisible, impenetrable wall um, nonetheless. Well, I, you mentioned the sort of fear element, and I, I wanted to ask about that a little bit. Um, you know, I think I mean, I think something, Patrick, that you mentioned, you know, you probably talked about in your thesis is, is about the way that fear is used to, to sort of stoke this anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, can you can you say a little bit more about sort of the connection there? And I guess I, I'll just say the other thing I was thinking about, um, Anika, when you were talking about the Title 42 stuff was um, the sort of post 9-11, like we have to band together against this enemy. And it, it feels like there's, a similar rhetoric sometimes happening around around immigration. Yeah, I can start. So something that we uh, kind of found in the preliminary research when it comes to uh, immigration and anti-immigrant sentiment and rhetoric in the United States uh, is there something called the perception of threat uh, theory, um, and that essentially there's a couple buckets uh, that it tends to fall into, but uh, it's essentially the idea that through the media and, and public opinion uh, that immigrants entering the United States are a threat to the American way of life, whether that takes form in something that we see now, it, it's like uh, they're taking our jobs um, or that they're criminals, you know, threatening. So with the jobs threatening, you know, your economic freedom or threatening, if you're assuming that they're criminals, your safety, things like that. Um, and then so that's the perception of threat theory, and that's been pretty consistent um, for a while. Uh, it just kind of changes based on the different buckets when it comes to different groups. Um, and then additionally, I think something that happened, I don't know the exact time period that it happened, but it was relatively recent, I would say within maybe the past 50 years, they started using, the media started using um, imagery of, it has to do with like water. So like comparing groups of immigrants to like tidal waves um, and to like make it sound more threatening than it actually is and that the numbers are a lot bigger than they are. So the idea of threat or of fear in the media and public opinion is um, really important to understand when it comes to immigration um, because I think that has contributed to a lot of the polarization that has occurred surrounding the issue um, because when you invoke fear in people, they're more likely to form a strong opinion about it um, and feel like they have to take action, essentially. Okay. So um, sort of sag on to that, um, you find that a lot of the work is often demystifying, right? Mm -hmm. And um, again, going back to the human humanity of it all, personifying who we we're talking about when we talk about immigrant communities. Um, and the fact that more often than not, they are our neighbors. Um, they are those in our places of worship. Um, they are um, the folks who we communicate with and who we value on a day-to-day -day basis and who contribute so much to our communities and to our nation. Um, and yet that is often um, covered by, honestly, propaganda. Um, and so it's so important when local people speak up. I think we find that our borderlands are often really powerful in that process because you hear about caravans and you hear about dangerous immigrants and then folks who are in the communities where many end up settling in the US or who see it firsthand are like, that's not what's actually happening here at all. Um, when we're talking about immigrants, we're talking about the people um, who sustain this country. We're not talking about people taking our jobs. The US is experiencing a worker shortage. Immigrants are keeping us going. And so often there's actually a counter um, fact that is truth in terms of what um, the role of immigrants in this country has been for centuries and what it continues to be today. Great, thank you. Um, there was a question about uh, this idea of documents like a UN immigration document for identification, um, which I, I don't know anything about, but I, I don't know, Anika, if you've ever encountered this, like whether that would be something that could 
help with any of the the, the red tape around entry? Yeah, I, I'm trying to skim the questions to see if I can get a little bit more concept. So I think about this in a few different ways. Um, Yes and no, I think the US is always gonna to wanna to have its own way of sort of quote unquote vetting people when they come. Um, but we do find some overlap with the UN, it's particularly within our refugee process, for example, where um, the UN will refer people specifically for refugee status. And so the US is relying on that initial sort of identification of people in that document review before it determines who they may want it. Emit. There are other classifications for refugee status as well, but that is a very strong primary one. Um, and then you have circumstances where maybe when you think about stateless individuals, that's a question like, how do we create some other sort of documentation, sort of other sort of process um, that may allow migration to be easier and, and more seamless for folks who don't have any other options. Um, but I, 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 I think in very rare situations is the, is the issue really about documentation. We see that with refugees sometimes. We see that a lot with our Afghan arrivals who due to dire circumstances um, may not have their documents um, because of how quickly they had to flee or because they were instructed to destroy them or whatever the case may be. Um, but usually it's, it's, it's less about the paperwork and it's more about who's coming, where are you coming from um, and the means in which you try to, to get here. Great. Well, I want to turn to a question that, that I, I'm very interested in, in the discussion about. Um, this question about how do you stay connected to what is just without being an immigrant oneself? And I, I think that really gets to the, uh, like, what are the personal experiences that, that people can bring, you know, without necessarily having a, a direct immigration experience? And I, I'm, Patrick, it seems like you've worked through this uh, some. So do you want to talk about that? Yeah, for sure. I think the main thing, something that I think has been a common theme throughout this entire conversation is really just trying to humanize the entire process and putting yourself in the shoes of the people that are going through the process. Um, and so for me, at least, I think, well, I've taken a lot of classes. So I've tried to stay educated on the issue and, and you know, keep up to date on what is just and unjust. Um, but I think the easiest way for me, at least, to kind of make my own opinion is just to get an objective point of view about what is happening. So for example, um, last year when, or two years ago, whenever it was that families were being separated, children being separated at the border. Think about if that was your child and your, with your child was being separated from you. Like clearly that is not something that, you know, you would want to happen to your family. That is, I would say pretty objectively an unjust policy. Um, when it comes to creating a pathway to citizenship for DACA recipients, which is what I was advocating for the, uh, my entire junior year through the Advocacy Corps program. Um, when you think about what DACA actually is, it's just a protected status for uh, people that arrived to the United States um, as young children. Um, they have basically no control over the fact that they ended up here. Um, and they, for the majority of their life, did not live in the country that their parents are from. Um, and that program protects them from being deported. Um, and so you think about, is it just to deport somebody who had absolutely no say in the decision to come to the United States and knows nothing else? Um, and if you sent them back to their home country would have essentially no idea about anything about how to you know, thrive there. Um, and I think when you kind of analyze the situations like that, it becomes clear what's just and what's unjust. And then just staying up to date with the you know the new updates and the headlines of what's happening uh, at the border and and with our foreign policy. Yeah, I I would say I think Patrick brings a good point from someone where um, I don't identify as Quaker, but naturally as I've shared, I appreciate a lot of Quaker principles, and I also have my own faith tradition. Um, and I, a lot of that is grounded in biblical principles. And so as you know, you know, we talk a lot about love thy neighbor, no exceptions. And you think about the actual biblical verse, it's love thy neighbor as thyself. And I think Patrick sort of lifted a lot of that. What would you want if you were in that circumstance? And then I think a part two for me is a lot in movement work, you have the saying nothing about us without us. And so if we're doing work about immigrants, immigrants should be a part of that conversation and they should be leading that conversation. And so, um, 
FCNL, our work is that of an ally um, organization. And so we work a lot with impacted communities and movement groups who represent those um, with whom our work impacts and has a direct um, effect. And then I think the part two for me is um, sort of, I think it, many of us can think of folks in our community who have an immigrant background. And so I, I, I see the pictures of my loved ones or my community members in the work that I do um, and how I want my work to be able to honor them um, and to, to meet the circumstances that they maybe might also be experiencing in the aggregate. Yeah, thank you. I know um, just to keep on the storytelling storytelling theme, you know, one of the things we talk a lot about uh, when we're training people to go in and lobby is about, you know, what kind of story to, to tell and how important it is that you're telling your story and your connection and not telling someone else's story without their consent or permission. And so I think, um, you know, as, as Anika said, being connected to affected communities and, and taking the lead on, you know, what they're looking to, to do for themselves and, and being an ally on that. And then also thinking about like, what in your experience leads you to care about this issue and, and um, whether that's a faith tradition or a, an experience you've had or um, what it is, but um, just being aware of, of whose story you're bringing into that conversation. Um, well, this has been really rich. We've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> um, I wanna to close with one final question, um, you know, this, this can be kind of a heavy topic, I think, um, especially thinking about, you know, as Anika said, the, the, the length of time that we've been working on these issues and the number of people affected. Um, you know, life and death, people's ability to be with their families. And, um, but I think it's important as advocates working on these issues that we think about how do we sustain ourselves. So I would like, as we close, um, if you could both share something that brings you hope in this work for migration justice. I can start. Um, something that I think brings me hope, bringing it back to spring lobby weekend. Um, I was asked to be a delegation leader, I believe in December or January, because FCNL wanted more presence with the Notre Dame community. Um, and so I started to, I accepted and um, within, I think I sent out the original like blurb advertising that I was leading a delegation to my peers. Um, through the Student Coalition of Immigration Advocacy and then College Democrats. Um, and within two days, we had 30 spots. They were completely full, like um, almost immediately. Everybody that I reached out to was like super excited about it. And we actually had a wait list of five people that we couldn't take on the trip, unfortunately. Um, but they're now coming on the trip because some people dropped out. So everybody that was wanted to come is now coming. Um, and I think it's just really exciting to see the the excitement from my peers and just young adult, adults in general, because as cliche as it sounds like that is the future. Um, and if people are passionate about it now, hopefully that continues on and then that turns into concrete change. Fingers crossed. Um, I, I love that sort of, the, the momentum of people can definitely keep you going when you feel sort of um, weekend within yourself, having a community that you see doing the work and passionate about it can lift you up in your hard times. Um, for me, I think it, it's very much faith grounded and it's about um, having a very clear moral calling and sense of clarity so that when you do have the times when you're weary because you're going to get weary um, and when you're discouraged because you're going to be disheartened, something within you keeps you um, compelled and keeps you motivated. Um, and for me, that's this, the, the inner sort of channel, the inner light, maybe so to speak, of, of knowing that I'm working on the side of righteousness and on justice and doing good. Um, and that um, I firmly believe that that means eventually you're gonna have a fruitful season. And that means you're gonna have a triumphant moment, um, even if that takes a long time. And um, I think sometimes the harm in that is, do you glorify or romanticize the struggle? And that's definitely um, not what, what, what I wanna sort of uplift, but just knowing that, um, you will get there um, and that you have um, the spiritual sort of principles that affirm that. Well, thank you for both of you for joining this conversation and um, we've been very on message uh, in terms of encouraging participation in spring lobby weekend. Um, 
And I hope that um, if you know young adults or are a young adult, uh, that you will consider participating virtually in that event uh, starting on March 12th. Um, but I want to uh, turn things back over now to Emma to uh, give some reminders and close us out. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. And thank you both Anika and Patrick. That was really inspiring. Uh, so before we uh, conclude our discussion for the evening, I just wanna uh, make a few announcements and make sure you all know about a few things. Uh, as has been mentioned so many times this evening, um, please tell the youth in your life uh, that they can still attend and register for Spring Lobby Weekend. And I'm gonna put that link in the chat uh, so that you can spread that to anyone that you know. Uh, and then in addition, if you are inspired by tonight's discussion and wanna take an action, uh, here's an action alert uh, that will help you tell your members of Congress that uh, now is the time for a pathway to citizenship. So we have this action alert up on our website. And there it is in the chat. And then finally, I just wanna uh, let you all know to save the date for our March uh, Quaker Changemaker event. Uh, it'll be on voting rights and racial justice. Uh, and it will take place on March 30th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we're really excited about it and more information will be coming soon. Yeah, I just wanna say thank you all so much for joining this Quaker Changemaker event on migration justice. Uh, and a special thank you to our amazing panelists, Anika and Patrick, as well as our fabulous moderator, Alicia. Uh, have a great night, everyone. Thanks so much for coming and I hope to see you next month.